sausages. What's up? <laughs> Man, I'm running late. <laughs> I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. No time to fuss, no must, no must. I'm late, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. Have you ever seen those guys that get wound up, you know, kind of bound up, bound up in their energy drinks? You know, they kind of, you know, mile a minute talking. I don't do energy drinks. <laughs> I do food. Food is good. Good food. Yum. This is uh, poached eggs on toast, chopped up, and it's delicious, man. Hmm. But you know, sitting here, looking out over the Wasatch Mountains, I love seeing this red and green effect. You know, it's kind of like, wow. It just being far enough away, you can't really see the trees that have changed, but. Where I'm sitting right now, I have pine trees in this outer balcony that I can look at. And they kind of set the framework for what I'm looking at over the Wasatch Mountain Range. When I look up there, I, I saw the other day snow coverage, you know, on the peaks, you know, and in the little valley. And there's a pipeline coming down that has, I don't know whether it's water or oil or whatever it has. But anyways, there's some kind of pipeline that comes down. Kind of reminds me of Alaska <laughs> pipelines. But... There's this one hill that I call this Per Mountain because when I drive out the driveway or when I sit here, I can see one hill set apart, almost like like the Mount of Transfiguration. It's a lot like it, you know. It's kind of like um, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. It's like where I used to wake up in the morning and I used to see, oh, well, there's a church over there, you know, that has a steeple on it, but you know, that sits on the mountaintop now. But you know, it's the same idea of where Jesus would have, you know, been when he looked out over Jerusalem. And I've been up on that hill in the east looking back to the west and seeing the eastern gate. And it's beautiful. And I know one of these days soon, I'm going to climb that hill and look back over Bountiful and Woods Cross and Salt Lake City and Salt Lake and all the cities that lie around here and bless them. Because, you know, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be a blessing and not a curse. We're not here to curse someone. We're really not here to, you know, like, kick the dust off our sandals, you know, and escape out of the city like the disciples did at one time when some cities didn't accept their message. But rather, because we've been given grace now by what Jesus has done, we're able to bless those that despite themselves don't even understand the truth, much less have a comprehension of who is the truth. I met a woman today that it's been an awful long time defending herself and her false post about some hated person she doesn't like, the president. <laughs> And because this post was attacking the president, she defended it tooth and nail. Oh, she was a Pentecostal Christian. She said she was filled with the Holy Ghost, you know, and she was operating according to what she said she knew, you know. And she never quoted a scripture, and she never used the word Jesus ever. And I was fascinated by that, because I often find that deception is like that. Deception doesn't use the word of God. And deception doesn't use the name of Jesus, which is the two things that you can usually tell deception about. Now, subtler deception, of course, does use the word of God and adds to it or subtracts from it. And that's how you can tell you're being deceived, whether or not it's the volume of the book and it reveals Jesus, or whether it's just a portion of the book and it's being used to be taken out of context to promote something. We call that lots of times tendentialism, when you want to find something in the Bible and you find it by making it fit there inserting a idea or a premise before you even look at the scripture and let the Bible speak for itself. Because you see, the word of God speaks for itself, reveals itself. It is God's word as he is speaking to us, as we understand and comprehend it by way of the Holy Spirit applying it to us. It's not just simply sitting down and being able to cut it up and, you know, put it into segments and dissertations and theological predicates, you know, and coming up with a dogma or a dogmatism or a 
hermeneutic or homiletic that you've got down, because, quite frankly, that's just systematic theology. It's not inspirational to the point of it being God necessarily using it in a way that he can personally to you today. So I kind of like being able to eat what I enjoy, you know, like this breakfast. It tastes good. It's good for me. If I overdo it, I guess it wouldn't be, but eggs are good for me. I need protein. So every day I have to eat eggs. Because I need salt, and it tastes good, I always put a bunch of salt in it. You wouldn't like my food because it's too salty for you. But one of the things that we should do as Wasatchers is we should eat, we should drink, we should be taking care of our body. And in the same way, we should take care of our soul with our emotions by giving ourselves over to a certain type of feeding that goes on in your emotional part. Your body has three parts. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And your emotional part needs to be taken care of as much as your physical body. Your physical body, quite frankly, needs a lot of water. You have to hydrate. If you get dirty water, you'll get sick. <laughs> and whether it be diarrhea or some kind of, you know, miserable disease that really just dehydrates you even worse, you gotta be careful what kind of water you're drinking. Sometimes not so good. Now you can put additives in water. For instance, like fluoride, and they, they put fluoride in water because it eliminated a lot of issues with teeth and with other things that were going on in people's lives. And for the longest time, people were thrilled about that, and now they're getting on the kick of taking it out, which, okay. But no matter how you look at it, your body needs water. Your body needs food. You need to breathe. You know, your body needs certain functions and certain things that it requires in order to live, to have life, to have being, to exist. Same thing is true about your emotions, is that you are, a, you are an emotional being. You're not like the animals. The animals have a certain amount of emotion, but that's not the same as human beings. We have a different capacity. We go beyond what you think your little poodle is or what you think your little dog is if you dressed up as a kid. Not the same thing. I'm sorry. This is just animals. The animal kingdom is not the kingdom of man, nor is it created in the image of God. Just the way it is. And as such, because you have emotions, and because your emotions are connected to your physical body, there are connections that are bound together. If you don't eat, you get depressed. <laughs> really. Seriously. If you don't eat long enough, you get really depressed, and you get into kind of a tailspin where it's like depression and and false feelings of, you know, um, I was trying to think of some other ones that happens when you fast, too, but the point being is that if you don't eat, it does affect your emotions to a certain degree, and if you do eat, it affects your emotions. Like, if you eat a bunch of sugar, you get hyped up and wound up, and guess what? Your emotions get kind of, like, energized, so to speak. They get kind of pushed onto a positive spin, and sometimes some people get angrier, if they're an angry type of person, or they get happier if they're a happy kind of person, or they kind of get wound up if they're not subject to some kind of equilibrium in your body that keeps everything in balance. When you're an emotional person, that means you have to take care of your emotions. You have to learn to develop a certain amount of balance and a certain amount of feeding of those emotions. Often, rock and roll music. Hey! Just give me that rock and roll music. That's one way of feeding your soul if you're a rocker. Now, country western music, you know. I was country. Or well, country wasn't cool. I can't think of Barbara Mandrell. I was trying to come up with a better one. Yeah, Hank Williams, maybe, Junior, or Hank Williams. <laughs> My Yvonne's the sweetest one on the bayou. Son of a gun, we're having fun. But, you know, you get the point. Music doesn't just calm the savage beast. Music feeds your soul. 
I don't know if you knew that. But different kinds of music, instrumental music, hard rock music, blasting music. They've even used music when they were um, going after Noriega in, in uh, the Panama Canal, forcing him to come out of his compound by blasting some hard rock music at him. Music has an effect on your emotions. Music has an effect on your soul. You feed your soul daily with a certain amount of noise that comes into your soul. What you hear is going to affect your emotions. A person who's constantly told how bad they are really gets bummed out. And if you told that person every day of their life how bad they are and worthless and meaningless, not only would they believe it, but you would see that they would be a depressed, or as we say, suppressed, emotional type of person. Their emotions would be pushed down. They wouldn't enjoy the full spectrum or the full volume or the full capabilities of all the emotions that a soul can have. Because when God breathed life into you as a being, when you're in your mother's womb, you didn't know this, but most people think that, you know, God doesn't get involved in he only started in creation, then he kicked out, you know, and let everybody go about their own business. Well, if every hair on my head's counted, I, I got news for you. God is involved in the point of inception, and at the point that most people don't understand is that as being a tripartite being, meaning that we have three parts to us and that we are created in the image of God, in the same way that it started in Genesis, it didn't end. Whenever you procreate and you think that Oh, well, you know, of course there's like, you know, the man and there's the woman part, you know, and you put the man and the woman part together and you got, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go, <laughs> you go like that. They forget there's someone else there. God is there. God causes life to exist. That's why man doesn't really do it in a test tube too well. It still isn't working out so well. So, people like to think because of the procreation of animals, that there's a difference, or there's no difference between procreation with man, and yet man was created in the image of God. So, contrary to what some people think, God's involved in that new life that begins at the point where, you know, sperm meets egg, ovum complete, comes together, you know. Sure, you've got a biological being, but when do you have the Holy Spirit breathing life into that being and making it a living soul. When does the soul enter? Now that's an interesting question. But the point is this. You are created in the image of God and as such, so too, likewise, there's a time when God breathes into you and you become a living soul. Now when he does, and he can do that any time, whether from the moment of inception or whether the moment of birth or wherever you want to go with that one, because, you know, if you study the scriptures, it will answer it for you. But you are a soulful being. You have a soul that is the seat of your emotions, that is your emotive or emotional self. Now something else beyond that, which is amazing, is you are a spiritual being. Now it may come as a shock to some of you that you have a spirit. Matter of fact, there are people in Christendom Christianity that have argued in the past about there being a spirit. They said the spirit and the soul are the same. Well, God bless them. <laughs> I think soul is spelled S-O-U-L and I think spirit is spelled S-P-I-R-I-T. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of stupid, you know. When I see a word that says soul and I see a word that says spirit, I don't see them the same. So maybe I'm a little weird, but that works for me, and maybe it'll work for you, Wasatcher. Maybe you'll figure out that what we're about is the simplicity inside of the complexity. Because quite frankly, I look at creation as pretty complex, but I also look at creation as pretty simple. <laughs> it's kind of both at the same time. 
we teach that a lot of video, you know, you could be yes and no at the same time because you really don't know how God could be bigger than your limited duality. It's called God, and he's bigger than we are. So, in looking at this reality of who we are, that third part of us needs to be spiritual. Now, spiritually, we're born dead, you know, I mean, that's just kind of like what God said, you know, and so it's like, you know, when you were born, you know, you didn't have a spirit, you know, you kind of had nothing in there. It's kind of like, the Jews say you have a spark. Little yid inside. And the yid did what the yid does, and he don't do it no more than he does, because he didn't have anything else to breathe upon him, so he doesn't become any more than a spark. <laughs> so you're left in the dark. Do you get it? Oh well. If you're Jewish, you got it. Good. But, it is said that the nefesh, or the spirit, or the soul, at some point in time, God breathes upon a Jew, and that spark bursts into flame, and becomes a fire, and it becomes born again, and becomes the spirit of Messiah, the spirit of Moshiach. And that spirit of Moshiach, which the Ruach HaKodesh is really what the spirit of Moshiach they're talking about when they read the Tanya, or read some of the other Jewish books, is that with which God, in creation, caused creation to come into being. The Son and the Spirit and the Father are one, and they together create it. Now, some people say, well, the Son created without him not created. Well, it's true. And at the same time, the Spirit created and without him not created. It's true. And the same thing, Father, well, he created, he spoke it true. It's true. Because hero Israel, Lord of God, Lord is one, and they're one, just like you and I are one. I mean, you don't sit around looking at, hey, soul, why art thou cast down and why art thou disquieted within? Fear not, for I show you a praise him. Oh, wait a minute. David did do that. He spoke to his soul. Wow. Imagine that. Now, you have, at times, because you're a spiritual being, if you're born again, you now have something more than a soul and a flesh. Which, your soul and your flesh kind of work together for a long time. You get along with, you know, pretty much enjoying doing what you feel like and feeling like you do. Because whatever you do, you feel like, whatever you feel like, you do. That's kind of the way that a fleshy person is. They are so caught up and entwined in their emotions, they can't be any other way except emotional. So whenever you see someone that's reacting to you in a negative way of some type because you're talking about spiritual things, it's because they're not spiritual. They don't know anything of the Spirit. They can't see anything of the Spirit, nor will they comprehend anything of the Spirit. They're not spiritual. But when you're born again, when you become that spiritual being, when you become what Jesus said, born of the Spirit and not just of the flesh, that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit. You must be born again. He talked about that spirit that comes down from above, which is where he came from. The spirit that comes down from Father in heaven, our God, who literally breathes into life to make a living soul. He sends his spirit to cause us to be made whole or complete like he made us in the beginning, to become a complete body, soul, and spirit to become complete in who we are meant to be. That means that we become not only a physical person or a emotional person, we become a spiritual person. So we really have the capabilities of operating in three different dimensions. You know, the dimension physically, which we can see, touch, and feel, that kind of emotional dimension, which we really can't see it, but we can see the consequences of it. You know, we really can't put a finger on how we know it, but we can feel it, right? I mean, try to describe in a physical way, love. Try to describe in a physical way, hate. We can see the actions of them, but we can't see the actual reality of what that emotion is. So it's something that you can't see, you can't touch, but you can feel. And you don't feel it by way of an external impetus or input coming through, like, say, hairs, that, you know, like your, the wind blows on your hairs, or you pinch someone and they feel that pinch mark. Well, that's because it's coming through that input device, which is your sensors or your nervous system that feeds it to your brain and says, hey, that's a pinch. That hurt. Ouch. So you have action and reaction within the physical realm that is entwined with your emotions. But really, when you think of the emotion of it, you can't see it and you can't touch it. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? So, there is that part 
And beyond that, there's one other thing that God said. There's a spirit. Now, we've been eating our breakfast. I'm about done. And, quite frankly, filling my physical body with food does affect my emotional part because it makes me feel good. Because <laughs> when I'm full, hey, I feel good. But the part that can't be done is that I really can't do anything about my spirit with just food. Oh, it helps by not warring against my spirit. It helps by not being something that works against me, you know, spiritually. It helps by not causing me to have to deal with my emotional side. But there's something more than that that we have to do daily to really feed our spirit. Just like your emotions can be fed by music, our spirit has to be fed by the Spirit of God. According to what the Bible says, according to what Jesus said when he came and revealed himself as being the only begotten Son of the Father, you know, full of truth and life, full of the Holy Spirit, giving us that with which he knows from his Father, and that the Father had said, listen to him, in him I am well pleased, then when Jesus was teaching us and instructing us in how we should live, what we should live, and how we would prosper in life, and how we would be full of abundancy or an abundant life, he said that you've got to read the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same that was in the beginning was, you know, the Word of God. And as you read the Word of God, it goes inside you. You read it, you hear it, you kind of understand it spiritually because it's spiritually understood. It's something that has a quality to it, that because it's come from God, it goes forth from God, accomplishes its purpose, and goes back to God. Now what that means is that when you read it, when you hear it, when you do it, it goes forth from God, it accomplishes its purpose in you, and goes back to God. So the reality is that you are being changed into this process of development that's going to rearrange you into making you more of a spiritual, soulful, fleshy, or physical being than right now what you are, which is a physical, emotional, spiritual being. It's kind of like reversing the order and turning it upside down. Because on the one hand, you could say, well, I'm a very emotional person. Well, yeah, but that's out of order. Or you could say, you know, I'm a very physical person. I like building my body, you know, like I've got proteins and, you know, I've got amino acids. You know, I've got my, my terracin, taurin. I've got my taurins and my terracins. I've got my, you know, like listocene. I've got all of my, you know, little chemicals that help build up my muscular structure so that, hey, dude, I don't have a six pack. I got a 12 pack. <laughs> you know, I'm built. I got my shoulders, you know. You know, if you've ever seen somebody that's really just built, they're lacking in other areas. As a matter of fact, you can tell that they're really not sometimes as emotional as maybe, you know, some other caring person might be. And maybe a caring person isn't as built as a physical person might be. So you see, there's kind of this playoff. It's not really balanced. And if you didn't develop your spiritual side, if you didn't become more of a spiritual person that you are, and everybody knows you're a spiritual person of some kind, everybody knows that in some way, because everybody seeks after it somehow. You know, they'll go after, like, you know, checking out Eastern religions and yogas and, you know, playing with this, that, and the other thing. And it feels good for a while, and they satisfy their feelings. You know, some people will try some religions, you know, and they'll go after this, that, or the other thing. And it sounded good physically, you know, and emotionally, it, it kind of, you know, worked out for a while. But in the end, some place at some point in time, you really know there's something not quite right until you find that when you're walking in the light, you know what the truth is because you found Jesus. Now, Jesus said it that way. He said, look, if you want to know the truth, I am. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. If you come to me, I will accept you. I will bless you. I will encourage you. I will give you my yoke, which is easy. I will give you a way of understanding, which is simple. I will cause you to have a life that is full of peace, full of love, and full of joy in the midst of the very things that should be the opposite, which is 
trials and tribulations and anxieties and fears when everyone is going the wrong way, you'll be standing as the right way. When everyone is losing their mind for fear, you'll be confident and have peace. I will give you faith and encourage you to know my Father in a way you've never dreamed of, that you'll discover and uncover what life was meant to be since the beginning of creation until God comes and reveals himself by pulling back the universe and reveals heaven itself. And you won't fear at that moment, should you be here, but rather I will take you home to be with him so you'll know that your Father in heaven loves you even more than I do. And so when Jesus came and taught us that, he said that inside of us we need to build up this, this part of us, this missing link, so to speak, that has always been there, that once we were born again, we needed to grow up and become more like him, knowing the difference between that which is physical, that which is emotional, and that which is spiritual. And the only way to do that has ever been through the Word of God, through the Bible, through the words you read, through the things that you understand and comprehend as God begins to speak to you by His Spirit. Now because we're almost done with this food, and my emotions really are pretty peaceful. Because you know what? Every time I eat something at my age, I want to take a nap. <laughs> I get full and I get sassy. And I get brassy. No, when I get full, I get kind of laid back and calm and peaceful. Matter of fact, when you stuff me, you can fluff me and put me to bed because <laughs> I'm ready to sleep. But that's sort of what we should be doing daily. When we're reading the Word of God, when we're understanding those things that God wants for us. So as you know, Wasatchers, you know, I always look at, you know, daily light to give me just the Bible because that's all it is. It's just the Bible written in different portions and pieces, you know, and it's assembled together that a family at one time collected all these verses that fit a certain topic and they used to encourage each other by sitting around the fire where they were at, you know, and they, I think it was 1800s, but it may have been farther back, but the family used to sit together and the father would have one scripture, the mother would have another, and the son would have another, and the child would have another, and they'd all kind of like bounce off, but they knew. Nowadays, we're not so smart and we don't really pay that close attention because we have TVs, you know, we have iPods, and we have phones, and we have other things to do that occupy us from seeing, experiencing, or knowing the Bible like we should know or could know. And so we really don't just roll off of our tongue, you know, scriptures like, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, leave not in thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and let him direct your path. Or to, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who braideth not, but giveth to all men liberally. You know, we don't sit around thinking that those are real life statements in how to live your life and consider it and then ponder it and add to it, you know, to commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass, especially in regards to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and giving our life over to him and letting him direct us and not trying to figure it out, but rather to go about those things that he wants us to do daily as we know that he is leading us by his spirit and that we have the spirit of God within us because he's promised to give him to us and so that he came in order that we might have life and have that kind of life more abundant in this world as well as eternal life to come. So it doesn't just flow out of us as though it were a wellspring of salvation unto those that are the hearing and that people would not just hear it but that they would be doers of the word because we're constantly encouraging one another with words and psalms and spiritual songs and scriptures make a melody in our heart, constantly being about those things of the Word of God that causes us to live our lives according to being so spiritually minded we're all earthly good. No, I'm sure you don't do that. <laughs> so, Les Hatcher, we do daily light, which has the Word of God in it to give us light, to make and to lighten our load so we know how to grow in the knowledge, the wisdom, and the reality of being a spiritual being, being a body, soul, and spirit in right order of spirit, soul, and body, walking, talking, fellowshipping, and knowing Jesus in a personal and intimate way. The fruit of the spirit is temperance. Every man 
that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we in an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. In this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, when I look around, you know, I find people that, you know, behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. And you know, that's kind of what I do when I look around. I think, yeah, there are people that look happier than I. There are people that look like they got more money than I. And they do. <laughs> or they look, they look like they've got, you know, more of it together. Or they've, you know, experienced a lot more than I. And you know, I, I get a little bummed, you know. Of course, then I start eating. Don't you eat when you get depressed? You know, ice cream in the middle of the night. Dig out the half gallon. Start chomping. Makes you feel better, don't it? Well, when I look around and I compare my life and stuff to, you know, the riches of the world and the cares of the world and the things that I can see that I can lust after, the things that I could have that I want after, the things that I could definitely do and make me feel better, you know, shoot up or or sex stuff, or whatever it is that everybody puts up and sits in, or does in, and dives in, and gets in, you know, and the reality of sin, which is fun, and kind of be a wonderful thing, you know, that you can enjoy at least for a while, and you still try to get away with it anyways, you know, when you think you're forgiven, because some people compromise. But then I look at the Word of God one more time, and it says, oh yeah, yeah, okay, that's right. At the end of their life, what have they got and where do they go? What do they know and what are they going to find out? Then I realized, oh, that's why I do what I do. And I don't involve myself in ungodliness or sin or these other things because there's a consequence to it. It tears me down. It brings me down. It makes me feel fat, like a fatted calf ready to be slaughtered. It makes me a dumb sheep wandering around without knowing that I'm a man of God. It makes me become sassy and brassy and just kind of like filled with myself rather than denying myself and following Jesus. It makes me become lackadaisical and more kind of self-centered and ecocentric than caring about what God wants for me and making him the centricity of my existence the very being of which I live and move and have my existence. Because without God really giving me my life as he has, I would perish because I am one of those people that only live by the word of God. Daily I am restored as I teach, as it comes out of me, this words of life that come from the written word of God as I read it and as I consider it, as I plant it in my brain and I consider it, you know, with his name, how he would make it applicable to that with which the world says is so much fame that I look at it and say, oh, for shame that they have so missed the point of existence that they don't know that life comes from the word. For man shall not live by word alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, and I have it here. And I see it, and when I read it, and when I live it, and then when I share it, when I actually teach it, or say it, or speak it, or somehow in ways that God has inspired me to do by His Spirit, communicate it. Whew. Wow! From inside of me, it's almost like coming outside of me to 
outward to going back to God, accomplishing His purpose, I get the aftermath, the afterglow, that feeling that I know God, that I have been used by God, that I, I have God in me, that God is in me, that the Spirit of God dwells within me, that Jesus is in my heart, that Jesus has taken my part of my sin and removed it so that I could take his part and find within perfect righteousness, perfect holiness, perfect peace. Because you see, it's not the outward things that God is going to examine. He doesn't look at me on the outside and say, oh, be perfect. He looks on the inside and says, if I see my son in you, you are perfect. He who has the son has life. But he who has not the Son of God hath not life. How do we know that we are in him except that we ask him to come in? Behold, Jesus said to Christians in the book of Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. If any man would open the door, if any man would hear my voice, if any man would do the things I say, if any man would live the way I live, if any man would take up his cross and follow me, I will come in to him. And I won't just come in to you. I'll sup with them. And you know, I don't know about you. But I look at those mountains. Those mountains got red leaves, orange leaves, some green leaves, some yellow leaves. And I don't know for sure, but I think that those leaves are going to fall off. And I think real soon now, it's going to be covered with snow. And I'm sitting here in my shorts, eating and enjoying the sunshine. And the very fact that it is light out. I have satisfied my soul while I filled my spirit and enjoyed my food for my physical body by being temperate in applying what my body needs physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I have walked with God today, this morning, and talked with Him as I shared with you the way we should go. I have listened to His voice as he has literally spoken inside me, as I have thought of those things that I should apply to me, of the things that you could apply for you, and considered, well, where I will go and what I will do this day, to walk with him, to follow him, and to be with him throughout my day. When I look at the mountains and I see that snow is coming, I know I need to be prepared, for the seasons are changing. And so is the time and the place with which God may speak or choose not to speak. And a time is coming when God is going to not make it so easily available to us to know Him, to follow Him, or to walk and talk with Him. And it's talked about the rapture and the you know, end times, and we live in latter days, we know that. But there's also a time where people are going to be led astray in some way by turning away from what they know to be true to follow something they think is true. Like the false teachers that are out there or false doctrines. I can only say one thing about that, what's not true. There's lots of people out there saying lots of things. Our motto isn't, you know, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Although that's a good one. Because I don't want you to go out and keep constantly checking me up, you know, and checking me out and checking and finding out whether or not I'm right or wrong. What I tell you is this. Whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. If God is leading you, you may be an Abraham. You may go through some interesting experiences to different places and different places that you may not normally find other people there that, you know, may be of the same faith and ilk. But God may send you there anyways. Whatsoever it is that Jesus is teaching you, you will learn one way or the other, either the easy way, by reading it, 
applying it, being temperate, sober-minded, learning, and, uh, you know, enjoying it because it's kind of easy to eat. You know, it's kind of like fast food. Have you ever noticed how fast food's easy to eat? It's not like you got to take a knife, you know, and you got some tough steak or something, you really got to cut it up and chop it up, you know, and make it into chuck roast or something. No, fast food is meant to be consumed easily. Well, right now, you know, I mean, we can do that. You can learn things the easy way by reading it, you know, and applying it and, you know, listening to it and doing it. Or you can do it the hard way, you know. You can go out and, like, slap your head against the wall. You can beat your head against, you know, stone brick masons. You can fight to get right. You can fight for this cause or that cause or be all about all these other things that people are about. But I got news for you, Wasatcher. You don't have to live that way. <laughs> there is a more excellent way. And if you haven't learned that about Vidivo, I just want to share that with you. There is a more excellent way. And that is, love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, your strength, love your neighbors. You don't get to love, you don't get to not love. You love everybody and you'll find that as you do, especially if you start with the ones that you don't want to, It'll be so much easier to love the ones that you do as you follow him who first loved us. Because herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us while we were yet sinners. That is what it's all about, the gospel. The gospel is about God is love and God is revealing his love to us. And God has made a way for us to escape that with which is about to happen to the world. And if you don't want to be saved, if you don't want to follow God, if you don't want to know God, then ignore Jesus and you'll go to hell. If you follow and want to know what love really is, if you want to know God your Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, if you want to be found in Him, it's so simple. Ask. Jesus said, the Spirit and bride say, come. God the Father says, come. The Bible says, come. All of it just says, it boils down towards the end of the... The message at the book of Revelation, it keeps boiling down, boiling it down. I mean, at first it says, you know, behold, I stand door knocking, all these other things, you know, it kind of gets you into, you know, like, well, you know, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins, you know, and you get into all these things, you know, theologically, oh, yeah, okay, fine. But to be honest with you, in desperation, when you get to that place of just complete reality check, God says, come, come, in, come unto me, come, hey, here I am, come. Now, it's not always going to be that way. So I'd say today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, it says in the provocation. But if you don't know, and you haven't become a Christian, can I make that invitation to you and say, hey, dude, you're just flesh and soul. You know what I mean? You're just like walking around like not whole. You're only, you got a body and you know it. You know, you got some body, dude. You know, like, hey, check it out, man. I got a body. <laughs> right. You got a soul too, you know, because you've got emotions. There's no doubt about that. But I got news for you. You ain't got no spirit. Uh-uh, man. You know, you're just living like half a life. Okay, maybe you're two-thirds right. But two-thirds ain't three-thirds. And you're only two-thirds complete. There's a missing part. Maybe it's time that you start. Maybe it's time that you find that missing part and you become a spiritual, emotional, physical, complete being that God created you to be. And that's my prayer for you, Wasatcher. Be complete in all parts. Your physical body, which I'd rather treat as dead skin and dead badger skin, you know, like outside the tabernacle. But if you like your body, fine. You know, you could go build it up. You know, complete person. Be physical. Be emotional. But for God's sakes, don't neglect being spiritual. Because if you do, no offense. Why not make it? Rather, put it in its proper place and order. Be ye spiritual, emotional, physical. And in that, you're going to find perfect peace. Perfect love. Maybe like me. Perfect joy. <laughs> <laughs>